This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Craig LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Kate Metz, who is a technology correspondent for the New York Times and also uh, the author of, of this book right here, uh, Genius Makers, the Mavericks Who Brought AI to Google, Facebook, and the World. And uh, so, Kate, this was, this was a fascinating story for me. Uh, you know, when I was reading it, it was it made me realize not only how recent a lot of these events were, but also kind of how deeply rooted in history a lot of this uh, stuff is. Um, and I think at the end of the book, you um, mentioned kind of the origins of the book and how you were discussing a completely different project with your with your editors and uh, ultimately decided to write a book on, on the people. And most of the books that, of course, I uh, read and most of the people that I talk to in this space are focused primarily on, on the ideas. Your book it discusses the ideas, but it really talks a lot about the, the people. Um, what attracted you to the story of, of these people? Um, and to what extent is the story, you know, the traditional story of, you know, misunderstood geniuses struggling against, uh, you know, the odds and struggling against the um, misperceptions? You know, you've got, you, you, I think it was hard to find bad guys, but, you know, you had to, you know, Marvin Minsky shows up as sort of a, uh, you know, the, the, the bad guy in, in the story. But um, what drew you to this, the story of these of these people, these intellectual heroes? Well, in my mind, any good story is about people. Um, any good uh, New York Times story is about people, even if it's also about technology. Any good book to me is really about the people. And my aim with a small story or, or with a large book like this is to, is to tell a story about those individuals and then you can layer all those bigger ideas on top of that. These are really big ideas that are affecting us all. And I think the best way to understand that kind of thing is through everyday life, which we're familiar with, um, through people. And I think that, uh, and I really believe this strongly, the best way to understand those ideas are through stories like this. And where the book really got going is when, and in, this, sometimes this is luck to when I discovered how interesting some of these people are, how funny some of these people are, um, how their stories, uh, wove together, um, you know, ca came together, came apart, came back together again in, in real life. Um, if I could get that onto the page, um, that, that, that type of thing can really, really work well when it comes to people. Um, really understanding these things. But it might be a bit of a harder story to tell than kind of the traditional narrative of either scientific genius or of kind of an inventor genius, right? So if you're talking about Thomas Edison or Henry Ford, you know, and, and their labs and the factories and light bulbs, you know, everything here is, is really kind of happening, um, you know, in, in, in these in these, in their minds and in these kind of, in the computers and in these kind of unromantic laboratories. Uh, and, you know, when we think of interesting people, usually artificial intelligence, uh, researchers don't, don't usually crop up as the most in interesting people. Did, did you have, uh, trouble kind of spinning out the story given the arcane nature of the science involved, right? I mean, we're not talking about light bulbs and cars. We're talking about artificial intelligence? Well, yes and no. I, I mean, I think you're hitting on a lot of uh, interesting and important things here. You, you're right. In some ways, this is a classic story, right? Um, someone who believes in ide an idea, uh, even though those around them do not, and they continue to work on it, and then it, and it comes good, so to speak. And you're right. That's what happens here. And that that is is something everyone can relate to. Um, and it's the kernel of a lot of great stories. So that, that was in place. The other thing is that I understand your point about the arcane nature of this, um, that people might not expect, uh, these types uh, of individuals to be interesting. And I wanted to show that the opposite is true. Uh, we were talking, you and I, before we came on air about my father, he was an engineer and what I've often uh, said over the years is that engineers are more interesting than you think. Um, engineers, <laughs> engineers are people and they're not stereotypes. Uh, just like anyone in any profession is, is a person and not a stereotype. And, 
I think that if you get into my book, you see how fascinating a lot of these people are and they're fascinating in such different ways. Um, they're, they're individuals, um, with their own, uh, quirks and eccentricities and, um, those in some cases are very different than those of the person working beside them over so many years uh, on this, uh, particular project. Um, you know, I, I, I fundamentally believe, uh, that, uh, engineers deserve to be written about, uh, uh, scientists, AI researchers deserve to be written about just like anybody else. And mm -hmm. that's part of what I wanted to do here as well. Well, what's interesting about this story is that it kind of, um, it weaves its way back and forth between academia and, and industry. Um, you know, we have the, the, the key protagonists who have academic positions in NYU, University of Toronto, you know, Montreal and, and, uh, other institutions, you know, UCL. Uh, and then, you know, they're weaving, they're going back and forth between places like Google and, and Facebook, you know, uh, DeepMind and, and, uh, open AI and, and these, these places. Um, and I think part of the story is really the seduction of these scientists away from the academy. And, and there are a couple characters that, that really kind of put up a good fight and kind of, uh, you know, refuse to relinquish their position in, in, in the academy. And, and, and even the ones that do wind up going into industry kind of uh, insist on keeping one foot in, in, in the academy. Is, is that also kind of part of the story, this, this tension between theory and practice, the tension between, you know, the pursuit of truth for its own sake and the pursuit of, of, of mammon, you know, I mean, these, these folks got very, very wealthy uh, as a result of, of their work for these companies. Absolutely. You talk about the tension there. It, the tension is there and it's not small. It is very, very large. Uh, we, you mentioned earlier, there may or may not be villains here. Well, I think that there are certainly villains. Um, you, you know, you could argue the villains are the companies, right? The villains are, um, you know, the, these large forces in our world, uh, which are economically uh, driven. Uh, and that's, that is the real tension, particularly in the second half of the book. The way mm -hmm. I, I see it is you have these idealistic people for the most part who worked on this technology for decades. It never quite worked. And then it started to work and they were immediately sucked into, um, into industry. And you get these idealistic people in the industry so suddenly, and even they don't realize what those forces are mm -hmm. and how they are going to take hold of their idea and push it forward in ways they did not imagine. And that to me is, uh, is not only a tension, but a very large tension that we are all living through right now. You have this technology that is being realized in some very real ways, and then it behaves in these ways that even the people who created it didn't necessarily expect. Mm -hmm. And we're still struggling to deal with that. Um, these, these technologies are working in ways that are very promising and provide a lot of hope for us in certain areas. And then they, they're also working in, in the same way, um, uh, in situations that, that cause concern, uh, and you see the concern, um, from even the people who invented it. Now, Jeffrey Hinton is really kind of the hero of the book, the, the main character, so to speak, and, and, uh, and really the kind of the inspiration, uh, for almost everyone else in, in the book and in, in the field. And you begin the book with uh, a little narrative about how he was, um, ultimately brought into the private sector and how he was able to spin up a, a company, so to speak, very, very quickly, and then auction it off. And, and so from a business perspective, I think a lot of people would find it confusing. How is it that these, these, these companies like, uh, DNA research, which Jeffrey Hinton founded, how can they have any value, right? I mean, all of the techniques, all of the ideas, all of the methods, they're, they're all, you know, they're all public. They're all open source. They're all published in academic papers available to anyone who wants to access them. And so, you know, why would there be a, a bidding war for, for a company, which is essentially just a, um, you know, a, a, a shell, uh, that employs a, a couple of people, right? They're, they're really bidding for the services of, of, of these, these folks. Right. But, but 
their output is, is public? Is it just about kind of getting, you know, being able to share the space with these people? Is it being able to kind of get just a little bit of an earlier access to the thought process of, of, of these, uh, of these, of these theorists? You, once again, you're spot on. It is, it is not an acquisition of a company necessarily. It is an acquisition of three individuals. And these are individuals who had never worked in industry, really. You know, it's a professor uh, in his mid sixties, two graduate students um, who hadn't even completed their degrees. Google and those other companies in the opening of the book are bidding for the services of those three people. That is what was valuable and continued to be very valuable even to this day, um, you know, as this story continued to play out. Google and those other companies bidding for Jeff services need that talent because at that moment, there are so few people on earth who had worked in that area. Um, we can get at you know, the idea at the core of, of Jeff's research, the idea at the core of the book, it's called a neural network. It's an idea that dated back to the fifties, but by 2012, when Jeff is essentially auctioning himself off, there are few people on earth who know how that idea works because most of the world thought it would never work. Mm -hmm. And that's the dynamic there. And, and to this day, it's the talent that is valuable. Um, we needed a lot of stuff for this, for this to work. Um, you need the data. Uh, and you need the computer processing power needed to analyze that data, but you need the people, uh, to make that work. You know, as you see in the book, um, getting a neural network to work, some people describe it as a dark art or black magic, mm -hmm. right? It's about sort of coaxing something out of this data. These systems literally learn by analyzing the data and it's more data than you and I could ever wrap our heads around. Um, so it's about. Uh, sort of coaxing those machines to learn on their own. Uh, they do kind of take off in ways that are, that are beyond us, but you need these people uh, to guide them. And, and that's really what happened. And that's why the book begins the way it does, right? That auction set the stage for what would happen over the next 10 years. Um, and if anybody thinks, you, you know, that being an AI re researcher is uninteresting. Like read that opening, right? It's just such a, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't believe it as I was reporting it, that it uh, played it, out it looked that like, way. It looked like it was something you were going to, you know, it looked like a screenplay. Right? I could well, see that exactly. scene coming alive in a movie, right? Yeah. And even in, in the moment, right, you see this in the book where Jeff, you know, turns to his students and they say, are we in a movie? What is going on here? Right. Um, but that, you know, it's a very real moment that foretells a lot of what would happen over the next 10 years. Now I was interviewing Stuart Russell recently and, uh, we were talking about the AI winter, right? And there are actually, I think there are a couple AI winters and I think you, you go all the way back to the, um, I guess the earliest spring and, and talk about kind of how AI got, got started. And, um, you go all the way back to the 1956 conference at, at Dartmouth, where a lot of the strands were, you know, uh, were, were beginning. And it seemed like back then there were people like Frank Rosenblatt who were, thinking about how to, um, mimic the, the, the human brain and, uh, and, and these ideas kind of hit a, hit a brick wall. Um, and, uh, and you, you talk about, uh, Marvin Minsky and you talk about how symbolic AI really was the, or sometimes I think people call it good, good old fashioned AI, right. Was the, became the dominant strain. How much of that was really about ideas and how much of that was kind of about uh, politics and, and personalities, right? Um, a lot of times I think if you're outside of academia, if you're outside of the sciences, you know, you think that there, you have this kind of pure view of the best ideas win, but there's a lot of institutional frictions in, involved. Um, how much of that was really, you know, uh, about the people and, and the, the, you know, the drama. It's a little bit of both. You're right. As usual, it's a little bit of both. What I think, what, you need to understand, um, when it comes to this particular technology is that there was a missing mathematical piece, right? Fra Frank Rosenblatt built a neural network in the early sixties, um, and it could do uh, a particular task. It could learn to recognize printed letters. 
That's a relatively easy task. And he was able to do that with the technology of the day, right? The mainframe uh, computers of the day. Um, but the math was not strong enough uh, to do that same thing with photos, for instance. He couldn't mm -hmm. uh, learn to recognize objects in photos. He couldn't learn to recognize the spoken word as he claimed that it would because it had this missing mathematical piece. So that was needed. But then where the personalities come in is that there were some people who thought because of this math missing piece that it would never um, reach the point uh, that it eventually did. On the other hand, you have people like Jeff Hinton uh, who continue to believe and continue to think that, that they would find this mathematical piece. Um, there were even points of doubt for Jeff and, and others um, in his camp. But then by the mid eighties, you know, another, another great moment in the book is when Jeff and a couple of collaborators do find this missing piece. Uh, and there's a new um, moment of promise for this technology. Um, but along the way, you're right. You had these battles between academics and um, people like Marvin Minsky ended up uh, uh, having the upper hand. Right. Sometimes it's about who has the loudest voice and who can convince, uh, you know, the department of defense to give them the money, you know, for their particular project. And you do see the whole industry sort of shift to what you call good old fashioned AI, that symbolic AI, where you're basically putting engineers in a room and they define how the technology is going to work rule by rule, line of code by line of code. That became what people had the most hope for, right? That that would be the future and not these systems that could learn on their own from data. Uh, mm -hmm. but then, you know, decades go by and things shift. And, and that idea was back propagation, right? Uh, that, that Jeff came up with, um, and Jeff, he said, um, old ideas are new, right? And that, um, you know, in these old ideas that have been abandoned, there is, uh, there's a nugget of something which can be harvested. Um, what kind of personality uh, is required for that kind of persistence, that, that diligence, that, um, you know, unwavering faith in, in the, uh, ultimate success of one's curiosity. I mean, Jeff is a, is a, is an interesting character. What, what, what was it about his, his personality, which, uh, led to that success? And then also, you know, in order to pursue a path that involves a lot of dead ends, you also need some institutional freedom. And so tell, talk a little bit about the how he was able to, um, you know, continue down this path and, and hit all these dead ends until he was ultimately successful. You're right. It is, it is, uh, about him personally and about his particular personality. And you see this in the, the moment that he first embraces this idea, he embraces the idea at the moment it is at its lowest point, right? He's a graduate student at the university of Edinburgh. Uh, and has just come to this AI field and most of the world at that point had discarded the idea of a neural network, even his own thesis advisor, right. Um, uh, at, had, had abandoned this idea, had just recently moved on to that symbolic method you talked about. And yet Jeff still grabbed hold of that idea and did not let go for decades. So he had this fundamental belief. Uh, and that is what drove him. And I love that you mentioned this, this theme that, um, uh, of his own lab, uh, eventually at the university of Toronto, it was old ideas are new. And what that meant was, is that it didn't matter how old the idea was, what mattered was, had you proven that it wouldn't work. And if you had not proven that, then you should keep working on it. Um, no matter how much time went by, mm -hmm. um, if you got in that point where you proved it was wrong, then you could put it aside. But until then you keep working. Well, and do you think his success, it was in, in part due to being in what we might think of as the academic wilderness. I mean, look, university of Toronto is, is one of the, I, I love that place. It's a f fantastic university, but you know, most of the heavy lifting in AI was being done at, at Carnegie Mellon and, and MIT and, uh, you know, other places, um, maybe to what extent was kind of being a little bit removed from, from the mainstream? Was that, was that a contributing factor to his success? You think? I think that's part of it. And it's definitely the landscape, right? It was, you know, in the wilderness, so to speak. Um, he wasn't at one of those big universities in the U S 
But what you also have to remember is that he, there was a time when he was at Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. And when he, along with his collaborators, published that paper on backpropagation, that missing mathematical piece, he was at Carnegie Mellon. Then he himself decides to leave because mm -hmm. he did not, and his wife did not, want to take money from Ronald Reagan's Defense Department. He realized mm -hmm. that the only way to continue working on this was to take that money from the military, and he and his wife didn't want to do that, and so he leaves. Um, again, it's this very personal decision. He himself decides to go to that, uh, that wilderness, as you call it. Um, what's so interesting to me is that because he made that decision, the center of gravity for that idea that he believed in was there and not in the U.S. So when the idea starts to work, um, there's almost no one in the U.S. who's really working on it. The people mm -hmm. who are working on it are elsewhere. They're in Canada, they're in Europe, um, there are a few other places. And so then when, you know, Google and Microsoft and Baidu and China wake up to the idea, they've got to go to these, you know, what would seem mm -hmm. to be strange places uh, for the talent. Yeah, and the the other main character in, in the story is is Jan LeCun, and um, I think he had a, a slightly different history. Um, uh, at least you know after he came to the U.S., it was a little bit more mainstream working with with Bell Labs and and so forth. Um, and in in the book, you you quote someone who said um, that Jeff Hinton was the fox and and Jan LeCun was the hedgehog in this whole movement. What do, what do, what it was meant by that? Um, what, what what makes uh, Jan LeCun, the, the hedgehog of, of neural networks, deep learning. What, what that person, uh, you know, who, uh, a person who has worked alongside, um, Jeff and LeCun, LeCun is, is, is trying to say is that Jeff Hinton is an idea machine. And if you've ever spent time with Hinton, you see this, um, his mind works in ways that are always a little step ahead of your own, right? Even with his humor. Um, his humor is so good. It's half step ahead of you. Um, and he does see, um, the world in a very different way and, and, um, is constantly throwing these ideas out. Now, on the other side, you have Lacoon and what, what, what professor Malik, you know, who said that to me and is quoted in the book is trying to say is that Lacoon had this one really big idea, and it, it was called a convolutional neural network. And it's eventually the type of neural network that really started to work with image recognition. Mm -hmm. And so what he is saying is that you know, Jan had this one big idea that really paid off, and, and Jeff is this idea machine. You know, I, I did a, uh, a talk recently with Jan. And he sort of takes issue with this, right? He says, well, I, you know, I, I, I have my own ideas, you know, which is true, but you know, they're um, you know, what, what, um, the point there is that Jeff sees, um, the landscape in a very different way. Jan is very much an engineer. Um, and, and you see that when you talk to him and he's focused, you know, on the bits and the bites in some ways, Jeff has this almost ethereal way of, of looking at the world and, and taking um, you know, these big ideas and then, then trying to apply them. And he's not necessarily interested in the bits and the bites. He'll, he likes to say, this is part of his humor, but he likes to say he's, he, he's bad at math and he's bad at computer science. Right. I mean, that's not necessarily true. Um, but that's generally true, um, that he's about taking these big ideas, um, and seeing where they're going to go and pushing them forward. And he's not an engineer in the way that Jan mm -hmm. is. And now the first big practical application that, um, uh, came out of, uh, of, of Lacoon's, uh, project was, uh, kind of check reading, automated check reading. Um, you talk a little bit about it and I remember, um, back in the eighties, I guess it was, um, companies like Citigroup, they would send gigantic sacks of, of checks to Ireland, um, at 5 PM on the flight to Shannon. And then all the Irish people would be, you know, doing all the, the data entry, right. Reading these checks and reading off the amounts and, and the, and the, the addressees and so forth. And, and of course, you know, all of that has been replaced. And, and now, you know, when I, when I teach in my FinTech class, uh, I talk about that transition to, you know, the, where you can just take a picture of the check, uh, with your phone and, um, and the whole thing gets taken care of on, on the back end. 
Um, th- this is sort of a, a, a prototype of pretty much everything that we're doing right now, right? All of the automation is really built on the, on the processes, which, which were developed for that, for that application, right? That's exactly right. And the reason this is important is that Yon system, that convolutional neural network that back in the nineties, uh, could read handwritten characters, including on a check. The key is that it learned that task on its own, so to speak. You know, so the way that it worked back then is that Yon at, at Bell Labs, they basically got dead letters from the post office in Buffalo, New York. So they had all these examples of handwritten letters and you show those examples to the machine and mm-hmm. the machine analyzes, um, those letters. And it looks, you know, this is a, a neural network. It, it looks for the patterns that identify and define a letter E for instance, or a letter B or a letter C, whatever it is, it finds those patterns. And in that way, it learns itself to identify a B or a C or a D, um, that is in the long run quicker, um, than having those engineers in a room and they're trying to tell the machine, you know, rule by rule, you know, what an E looks like. You're never going to get there that Mm -hmm. way, especially when it comes to handwritten letters, because, you know, you have a different, you know, handwriting style that I do. Um, how are you going to write enough rules that define the way you do it versus the way I do it, the way everyone else does it. But if you can get all those examples and then feed them into a neural network and it can find the common patterns between all those Mm -hmm. different handwriting styles, that is super powerful. And that's what Jan showed in the nineties. Now it would still take another couple of decades, um, and, and a, a lot of work of uh, ingenuity from people like Jeff Hinton and his students to really make that work with images and to be able to identify a cat in an image, for instance, in the same way, or to be able to identify the spoken word in the same way. But that's what happened. And, and that's what you see play out in the book is Jeff and his students taking that idea and not only pushing it to the point where it worked, but then pushing it into industry, right? Jeff consciously did that, uh, first at Microsoft, um, and then through that auction at places like Google. Now, whenever you're telling a story, uh, as an historian, I mean, I think of this actually, I think of this as a work of history. Uh, it's, you know, it's recent, but it's, it's still a work of history. I agree. Um, and when you're telling a story, you, you know, you have to choose between continuity and, and discontinuity and and I think you're, you know, you're telling us a bit of a story of, of a, of a discontinuous leap in, um, you know, in how we process information, but you also have character. I think it was Alex uh, Krzyzewski who says, Hey, you know, all, all I'm doing is, is nonlinear regression, right? All I'm doing is, is curve fitting. And, you know, when I teach my, I teach a course on, on data science and machine learning and, you know, techniques like decision trees and so forth, they've been around for, for, for decades. Uh, and so, you know, I teach everybody how to work with, with structured data and then I say, oh yeah. And then there's deep learning and that's just same thing, except with, you know, unstructured data. <laughs> and of course, uh, I'm trying to convince them that, 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 that there's a continuity here, but of course, um, there's something very discontinuous. And, and, uh, I think that there was a quote in the book where you said, uh, nobody realized this could work. Uh, and then all of a sudden they realized, of course it can work. It's just that you need a, a massive increase in, in computing power. And, and so there was this, this rapid acceleration in the availability of, of computing power that happened uh, right around the time when this was discovered and, and kind of the defining moment, I, I think that everyone looks back to as kind of the, the, you know, the, the, I don't know, the, the there's that moment where, um, where Einstein was proven, you know, where they saw the, 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 the curvature of, of, of space time continuum was, was sort of the, 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 the cat dog story, right? That was a real moment when, when ImageNet, uh, you were able to show that you could distinguish between cats, cats and dogs that was made possible by all of this massive computing power, right? Yes. But it was also made possible by one other thing where right? you mentioned ImageNet, right? That's the, the contest that Jeff and his two, two students won essentially where they're 
you know, the whole world is competing to identify the dogs and the cats in these images. Well, image data is also, it's a collection of data. It's a massive mm -hmm. collection of digital photos. That is also what was needed. We needed two things. We needed the, the um, massive amount of data to make this idea work. And then you needed the computer processing power needed to analyze all that data. Mm -hmm. And those two things came together. And, and you're right. There's, there, this is different than what, what we've done in the past, right? You can, you can compare it to other ideas and say, well, it's just this, it's just that. And as I said, at the beginning of our call, it is just math, right? Mm -hmm. It's just mathematics, but we're now at, at a point where the system is learning from an, a, a scale of data that we humans can't wrap our heads around. That's something different. People didn't see this happening. They didn't see the system working because it needed such large amounts of data to work, right? That's a different realm that it, than the machine learning from these tiny amounts of data mm -hmm. um, that we can, we can really wrap our heads around. So you did have this, you know, this leap into a new area and you could see this in the book that the idea first started to work with speech, mm -hmm. you know, with Jeff and his students at Microsoft and, and it worked remarkably well, they really changed speech. Even after it worked there, the people in the image recognition world did not think it would work with images, right? Um, you know, it's very telling. And even after it worked with images, the people in natural language understanding, um, you know, the, the, the effort to make the, uh, AI un really understand language and how we uh, piece words together, they didn't think it would work there. And now it's working there. Right. Um, I, I think it's illustrative. And now of course, across the pond, there's a, there's a whole nother story playing out, right. With a uh, deep mind, uh, and how, you know, the, the, for, the story of that formation, I found interesting because, uh, Dennis, uh, Hassabis, uh, said that, um, you know, you could choose between writing grants or you could, um, you know, do pitches and, and, uh, why waste time? doing grants when you can do pitches, right? So the, like the venture capital became sort of the, the primary source for, um, you know, research funds in a way, uh, replacing the, the process that scientists would typically do, which is to, you know, apply to foundations and governments and so forth for, for, for grant money. Right. Right. See, there's that tension cropping up, right? The Demis and his co-founders have a choice there. They, are they going to go into the academic world, become professors and write grants, or are they going to go into industry where the money's bigger, um, and they can do bigger things with it and they choose the latter and that has implications, right? It does mean the technology improved at a faster rate, but then also all the other forces come in, including this kind of extreme optimism uh, of Silicon Valley, right? Mm -hmm. In the tech industry, um, Demis and his co-founders co-founder, have their own optimistic outlook, or right? they, they believe that they're creating what they call AGI, a system that can do anything the human brain can do. Well, once Silicon Valley gets hold of that idea, then things really, you know, really go in directions people may not have expected because Silicon Valley in a way took that, that very literally. And, and you get to the point, even in the mainstream where people are saying, you know, this is around the corner. Um, you know, this, this type of machine, and that's not necessarily the case. So I think that's, it, it, it is a fascinating moment when Demis and his, his co-founders go in that direction. And you're right. Their story is, is equally, uh, fascinating, uh, to this other side of the story with, with Hinton and Lacoon. And of course, a lot of ethics comes up in, in the story because, um, especially when you think about AGI and, and you tell a story about how. Um, you know, Elon Musk and, and some others were, were funding uh, OpenAI project, and and there was a lot of um, the folks in, in in London did not want their um, their capabilities to be used for for military reasons and so forth. But you know, it's it's almost inevitable that um, at some point this is going to be an issue, right? And at some point there are going to be some difficult choices that they make, and it's almost impossible once you become part of a large corporation to try to decide how your technology is, is, is going to be used. Um, tell us a bit about that, that story and, and that tension and, um, and, and ultimately, you know, how the players, uh, went about re resolving their, their, that tension. 
Well, uh, this is one area where those two threads of the story, right? The Jeff Hinton thread and then the deep mind thread, they, they come together, right? And this is what I was talking about. You have these very idealistic people. Jeff left the United States because he did not want to work with the military. Demis uh, in London joins Google and as part of the contract, um, he and his co-founders say, we want an assurance that you will not use our technology with the military, right? It's the same ideal. Well, not too long after that, Google, the company that acquired Jeff Hinton and acquired uh, Demis Asabas and DeepMind, pretty soon it goes to work with the military, right? And those tensions come to a head. Um, that, that was a very real thing. And um, we're still trying to figure out um, how we're going to deal with it. I think you're right. It's, it's inevitable if you develop this technology and certainly if you move it into industry, that we're going to move in that direction. Um, governments, um, are going to be interested in that technology, uh, as mm -hmm. a way, um, uh, of building weapons. Um, and that is, that is going to happen. Now, how is that all, all going to play out? It's unclear. We, at Google, there was a big protest. Mm -hmm. They actually ended up pulling out of this project, which was a path eventually towards autonomous weapons. They were, they were building technology using a neural network that can identify objects and drone footage, right? So mm -hmm. people and vehicles and buildings that could be used for a lot of things for surveillance, for reconnaissance. And eventually you put a weapon, you know, on your drone and it, you know, it becomes an autonomous weapon. And that's what people are concerned about. Google actually pulled out of that project after the, uh, employee protest. Um, but what's less talked about is that so many other companies continue to work on that, including mm -hmm. some very big internet companies, right? Microsoft was involved in that project. Amazon was involved in that project. Palantir, this new company mm -hmm. built by Peter Thiel, by the way, the person who invested in DeepMind from the beginning, right? They're working on this. So mm -hmm. the world is moving in that direction. I think you're right. Um, there's still that tension there and like there's tension in a lot of other areas in my book. And we're still waiting to see how all that's going to play out. Well, it's like Alfred Nobel, right? I mean, when he invented dynamite, he was, uh, uh, you know, horrified at the uses to which it would be put, but there really wasn't much he could do about it other than, you know, create the Nobel peace prize, right? right. Uh, with, <laughs> with the profits that, that he made from, from the technology, right? A absolutely. Absolutely. It's the, it, the you know, you, you talk about, you know, classic stories. Yes. Th these are classic stories that are coming back. Right. We, and you see this in the book, how we repeat history over and over and over again. You talk about the AI winner and the hype cycles. It's funny how that just, it is a cycle. It just keeps repeating itself. And then these old stories come back and we we're always creating things with these, these ideal idealistic visions in mind. And then the reality is different, right? When you, when you push them into the real world, um, uh, things happen and they aren't always what you expected to happen. Well, if the, if the cat dog, uh, success was a uh, defining moment, I think the, the other defining moment in this history was the, the triumph, uh, uh, of, uh, over, uh, over go, right. Uh, it, the triumph over the, the, the experts, uh, and the champions in, in the world of go. And you, you go so far as to say that not only was this a, a huge event, just globally, but in particular, it was like the Sputnik moment for the Chinese because it happened on, on Chinese turf and, uh, they, they refused to, um, televise the event, refused to publicize the event, lest the, the Americans get too much credit or the, you know, British get too much credit. Um, what, tell us a, a bit about that, uh, because that, that really involved also a, a very different way of utilizing AI. Um, and developing high quality decision making. Well, yes and no. I mean, in a way, it's the same idea. The reason that machine was able to work is because of you know a neural network, right? The same concept. Um, you know what they did is they applied it to gameplay and Go mm -hmm. in particular, which is a game that's exponentially more complicated than chess. People didn't think that a machine would beat the best humans at Go for decades to come. Demis and DeepMind, however, built a system that, that did that in 2016. And it first did that in Korea, right? Mm -hmm. So you had this moment 
where they take their machine to Korea and they beat Lee Seedol, who was the best go player of the last decade. And I was there for that. It was, it, it was an unbelievable moment. Um, because you had this whole country focused on this match and, and most people thought that the machine didn't have a chance. Well, the opposite was true. And you could feel like the sadness, um, envelop this country as this machine, uh, beats, you know, one of their, their favorite sons. And, um, you know, that was very, very real. Now it also had this sort of bright side where he comes back and he mm -hmm. wins the fourth game in this match. And it showed you the hope for this. And, the, and he really was learning from the machine mm -hmm. in, a, in a way. And then a year later, when Google takes this same machine to China and they want to show it off in China, they see this as a way of getting back into the Chinese market. And you could, you could see that phenomenon there too. So many of the best players in the world were there. And they had changed the way they played the game after watching this machine. Literally, they would, they would, even with the first move each match, they changed the way they would open the match, mimicking this machine. So that, that idea that a machine can help us was very real, but you're right. There's this other side to it where Google is expecting this to be at their coming out party in China. They're going to broadcast this match on national TV. Um, and then something very different happens and the Chinese government wakes up to what's going on here. They shut down, uh, the, 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 the TV feed. And I was there, they sent this, this, uh, directive to all the Chinese journalists who were there and said, if you're going to write about this, you cannot use the word Google, right? Okay. That's a telling moment. And it's right before, uh, the Chinese government really puts its stake in the ground when it comes to AI and says, we're going to go after this in a, in a very big way. Um, you know, that, that, that's a real moment on, on many levels. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the la one of the last, uh, kind of developments in this area that you discuss in the book is the idea of, uh, a generative adversarial networks. And you talk about Ian Goodfellow, who is the, the, the GAN father, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and what I, what I, what I liked about one of the quotes is that, you know, what AI cannot create, it cannot understand. And, and so, so, you know, rather than simply processing information, rather than simply in, interpreting data, you know, AI is, is moving to the point where it is, is, is creating things, right? Creating things that, that you can't distinguish, uh, whether they were created by humans or, or not. And so, you know, a lot up until this point, I think the human role is just very, very important, even if it's just so far as you're, you know, you're labeling data and so forth. But, but the, the idea of these, um, adversarial networks, uh, is I think it's an incremental step, uh, beyond what was being done, done earlier. Um, could, could you talk about how do people in the sector think about this? Do they think about this as, as a, as a profound leap, uh, uh something that opens up new possibilities? Absolutely. And I love that you, you quote, um, Ian Goodfellow, who's actually quoting someone else or paraphrasing someone else, right? Richard Feynman, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, in saying, you know, what an AI, um, um, you know, you, you know, you can't understand without being able to create. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, these are incredible people we're talking about Richard Feynman, you know, what a character, um, and then Ian Goodfellow in his own way. And that, that moment where he creates the idea of a Gantt is, um, uh, one of my favorite moments in the book, because it's so incredibly funny, right? Um, people have the stereotype that, uh, engineers and scientists are somehow dour. Um, Feynman was, a was, a was he, such he, a, didn't uh, he invent it half drunk or like, <laughs> he right, thought exa <laughs> exactly. Um, but also, you know, the way he, he relates the story is, is so incredibly funny, but you're right. It's, it's essentially taking a neural network and turning it upside down. If, mm -hmm. if the machine can learn, you know, the patterns that identify what a cat looks like, it can, it can learn to recognize a cat, but it can mm -hmm. also learn to create its own image of a cat. And that's, what's going on there is, uh, you turn these systems upside down and they can create images. They can create sounds, they can create text. And that's what we're seeing now is these systems are getting better and better and better at creating content. And that that's a powerful thing on, on many levels. And it's a scary thing on many levels. Uh, you know, we live in this age 
uh, of concern over disinformation. Well, these are, these are means of creating disinformation, mm -hmm. potentially on an enormous scale. And we're getting systems that can create images and videos and tweets and blog posts and entire articles that look like the real thing. Um, and that's where that chapter goes, right? Is, is, is real concern, um, over GANs and similar technologies as a way of creating disinformation. Now we're not to the point yet where the machines are perfect. Um, you know, a, a story I often tell is, um, recently I was writing a, a piece for the times about these new systems, they call them language models that analyze all this text mm -hmm. from digital books and the internet, Wikipedia articles, uh, uh, you know, other content, um, uh, from the internet and they learn the vagaries of language and then they can generate their own, uh, language. They can generate tweets, mm -hmm. like I said, and blog posts. And you know, I wrote this story and my editor said, all right, we really want to show this thing in action. Let's, let's get it to give you a speech in the voice of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, I said, great idea. And let me tell you, we didn't end up using this for, for maybe obvious reasons, but this, this system out of the open AI lab in San Francisco called GPT three generated a speech in the voice of Donald Trump. That you would not believe, I mean, it was just <laughs> pitch perfect. Um, but the, the caveat there is. You have to roll the dice, um, uh, many times to get that, right? So if you ask for 10 speeches in the voice of Trump, you might get five that are really good. The other five are not. So there's a gap there. And, um, when it comes to you know, creating and distributing disinformation, it's not a real danger until it can do 10 out of 10, right? Then we're in trouble. Then the machines can generate disinformation at a scale. Um, that, you know, uh, you know, a handful of humans in a, in a room never could, um, but we're on a path towards that. And that's why people like Ian Goodfellow do see this as, as a, as a serious change, um, that, it, you know, we as a society really have to think about, are we going to get to the point where we have to think about anything we see online differently? We might get to that point. I think it would only strengthen the, um, importance of curation, right? So, uh, something like a New York times is, is only going to be, I think, more valuable in a world where you are surrounded by deep fakes and, uh, fake information. You know, you, you, you're going to get to the point where you're not going to trust anything unless it comes from someone that you, that you, uh, that you vetted. Um, so, uh, the, you know, the last thing, I think you do mention a lot of ethical concerns towards the end of the book and uh, one possibility that a lot of folks in the field have talked about is um, some kind of um, agreement as to what the acceptable bounds of the technological use are. And so everyone talks about the uh, Silomar conference um, related to uh, genetics and, and, and so forth. Um, and there have been some calls for a similar type of, of conference uh, among AI professionals. Do, do you think that, do you see in the community um, uh, a, a increasing concern around this or have people more or less, um, given up on any kind of controls or, or has, you know, optimism about human nature prevailed? What, what's the current state of concern about the G evolution of G uh, general artificial intelligence? There is real concern and to the point where the AI community convened, you know, at the same place out of Silomar, um, uh, for, for a meeting along similar lines, discuss, you know, the concerns that AI could move in that direction. There was a, a meeting even before that, um, you funded in large part by Elon Musk, um, uh, in Puerto Rico, um, you know, along the same lines. Um, and that continues to be a concern, uh, for a lot of a lot of people. Now, the rub there is that, you know, that group of people is looking at, you know, for the most part, you know, a system that will do anything the human brain can do and, and, and but more powerfully, and then eventually spin outside of our control and, and, and maybe destroy us. And, you know, the, the criticism of that mindset is that that is a long, long way off and that, um, 
maybe that's not what we should be focusing on now, but maybe we should focus on the here and the now where there are already, uh, these concerns, um, autonomous weapons we discuss, <laughs> um, uh, the, the disinformation problem we discuss. There's also the issue of bias in these systems. They can be biased against women and people of color because they learn from all this data. They learn from our flaws, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's so many other issues that we need to deal with today and there's some overlap, right? Between the, the two groups, right? You know, there's a lot of concern from the AGI camp on, on these other issues, but, but, but really there are these concerns now that need to be dealt with. And, and that, um, increasingly is becoming the focus and the industry is waking up, um, to, to this type of thing. We'll see how it all plays out, right? The, these companies still have a, the profit motive driving them and, um, they aren't going to be as concerned with those things necessarily. Um, but, but, but there is, um, a lot more concern in general. Um, at least a, a, a lot more awareness of these issues. Mm -hmm. And I, I think towards the end of the book, you um, tell a story about how uh, Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun and Joshua Bengio won the touring award uh, finally. Um, and I was actually, I, I, I reminded me of how recent that was. Um, it was certainly long overdue. Um, do, you, do you think that there's, there's a, took a while for the academic, uh, establishment to, to really appreciate the magnitude of, of this change. Um, did it take longer for the ac academic, uh, establishment to recognize this than, than it took industry to recognize it? Well, I mean, this gets back to something else we were talking about is, you know, academia is, um, it's, it can get contentious, right? Um, there were a lot of people who didn't believe in that idea. And there are some people who are still kind of bitter about the fact that, you know, that idea is getting so much attention. I think that might've played into it. Um, right. Some people think that the neural network idea got too much attention in the press and that, you know, it's, it's, it, it, they like to point out how limited it is. And, and you see that in the book too, with people like Gary Marcus, uh, who were intent on say, Hey, look, this is, this is a limited idea. It is, um, certainly to this point there. A neural network does certain things well. There are other things it does not do. Um, but, you know, what I do show in the book and aim to show is that there are so many areas where it has really changed the tra trajectory of things, right? So there is this very real thing that happened, um, you know, in 2010, 2012, um, and it really changed things. And you could see that, uh, certainly. But there are a lot of people who, who, you know, are still reluctant to give the idea too much attention, uh, think that, you know, Hinton and, and Lacoon, um, you know, have had too, too much light shown on them. Um, so I think that there's a little bit of that, uh, uh, going on. Um, uh, you're right. It did take them a while, uh, to win the award. Well, I think, Kate, you're not going to run out of interesting stories uh, anytime soon, <laughs> uh, out here in the Bay area. Uh, thanks so much for joining. I really appreciate your reportage. Genius makers, unput downable story about a bunch of modern scientific heroes. Thanks so much. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 